Sam. And I'm Harrison. And we played some games, watched some movies, and bought some stuff. So which do we want to do first? So this is pretty much like every week we ever have. <laughs> Except with Listen extra to... latency this time, because <laughs> even few of us, fewer of us are in the same room. Just to say none of us. Listen Ooh, to us latency. as we chronicle where our paychecks go. So uh, I guess we can start with movie times, because that, that's usually a thing. Uh, so you, Sen, saw The Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, it's In only case, one of the two of biggest movies of the summer. Because <laughs> I've been too busy. Sad. Right, I, I finally just had to declare screw it and uh, go ahead and just see the thing by myself. Considering everyone else on Earth has either already seen it or is not interested in it. Not true. I just uh, haven't seen it yet. Pixie and I are both super interested in it, we just can't. So, uh, I guess we're gonna go spoiler-tastic on this one, so this is your one and only warning, all, like, two people who listen to us. Alright, so... Both of warned. you have been warned. Okay, so, obviously, this is The Dark Knight Rises, it's the third in the trilogy of the Christopher Nolan Batman films. Um, just gonna say... It's a worthy ending to the trilogy. It, It is not the best movie I have seen this summer. In any way, I cannot say that. Is it a good film, though? Hell yeah. It is a most entertaining use of two and a half hours of your time. Uh, it maintains Christopher Nolan's gritty realism, even everything down to the Batwing, probably one of the silliest Batman inventions, is totally realized in a way that would work in the real world, that looks believable. Inside Baseball, uh, Christopher Nolan is crazy about special effects, which is to say that the Batwing was a full-size prop that people were actually in, being hoisted around on a crane. So I am in no way surprised CG. by that. No, I, I didn't think it was at any point, because you see multiple actors interacting with this thing. Um... Obviously, the, the key part of any Batman movie is going to be the villain. Uh, that's been the same for all three of the Nolan Batman movies, as well as every Batman movie before it, because, let's face it, Batman's kind of boring, so you put cool things next to him, and he does okay. Uh, while I will say flat out that Bane and Tom Hardy's performance as Bane, it's not even in the ballpark of Heath Ledger as the Joker, I think it's kind of unfair to complain to compare the two just because of the nature of the character. Like the Joker has always been this charismatic out there over the top acting foil for whatever performance the actor wants to put on it. Bane as a character is goddamn nothing. He, he's just a big stompy monster. I feel like and and part of I saw a picture of Tom Hardy's Bane on Reddit's r slash Lady Boners. There, there have area. been a number of those, actually. And I'm confused because he reads as completely, like, I don't want to say asexual, but as a non-sexualized entity to he me. He is. He's completely non-sexualized in the movie as well. It's like I, I, I look at him and I think of like a gargoyle or something. Like that, that's pretty much what he is. He is a big scary statue. He is there to be threatening, physically imposing. I'll admit he has some really awesome charismatic moments where he's talking to the crowd. But really, because of the modulation done on his voice, it doesn't feel like it's coming out of that character. I think that's the problem with it. Like, well, it's inhuman. And yeah, it's got the mechanical tone. It's also higher pitched than you really feel it should be. It's in movie explained as an effect of the the mask itself, which is apparently uh, preventing him from being in hideous amounts of pain. But it doesn't feel right. Um, to to quote my brother on it, we just discussed on the matter. It's like the dogs from Up. The voice just doesn't feel right coming out of that character. Which in no way is a criticism of Tom Hardy and his performance. Bane is awesome in this movie, especially from what the character is based off of. Possibly one of the worst garbage leftovers of the 90s in comic books. It, he is a terrible, terrible character. He's not a terrible character, he's just not uh, interesting enough to be a center point on his own. I mean, no, he's, he's awful. Very 
Like, compared to the rest of Batman's gallery of villains, like the Penguin, uh, Mr. Freeze, the Joker, even the Scarecrow, like, hell, Killer Croc's more interesting than Bane. Yeah, but it is valuable to have a character who is rather mundane amidst a bunch of characters who are potentially kind of pretty silly if you look at them face on. Bane, a giant, juiced-up Mexican wrestler, isn't silly? He's just a muscular guy who hates people. That's that's his deal. I mean, think, of it, think about it. That's basically every video game protagonist released in the last ten years, isn't it? Right. I mean, Bane is boring as hell, but mm -hmm. what Christopher Nolan did with him Sing. is really spectacular. I mean, he made this character interesting, gave him a little extra depth. I mean, one of the cool reveals of the plot is who this guy really is, and when they do that, it is spectacular. You know, throughout the whole movie, you go in thinking, oh, he's Ra's al Ghul's kid. And then suddenly, like, they do the big plot twist, and it's like, nope! Suddenly, he's so much cooler. Well, go for it. Tell us. I can't wait. Uh, well, we obviously I... know from the casting rumors of this movie that Talia al Ghul is in this movie. Uh -huh. Like, they flat out said that we hired the actress to play Talia al Ghul. She's in there. And... Like, really, that's supposed to be a giant twist in the plot. Just having casually watched the Batman TV show as a kid, like the animated series, I called who she was about 20 minutes into the film. And I'm like, oh, alright. Kinda waiting for this to happen. Oh, so speaking of, can I interrupt your review for something? Yeah, yeah. This, this ties into, I went shopping yesterday and found in the bargain bin at a big box retailer Batman the Animated Series Out of the Shadows which contains four episodes from the animated series Woo! It is less than five dollars I couldn't not Totally worthwhile Do we have some good episodes in there? Uh, let's see Episodes include Two-Face Parts 1 and 2 Great episodes It's Never Too Late and I've Got Batman in My Basement Okay, I don't know the last two, but I remember the Two-Face ones as being some of the best animated uh, episodes of that show. So, I guess continuing... Um, well, okay, you yeah, I mean, explained who Bane is. <laughs> Bane is this common thug who was in but, the prison that Talia al Ghul's mother was incarcerated in. And uh, so, when Talia was born he decided he would take care of this child and give her a chance. He's the reason she escaped the prison, and he got left there to be tortured and disfigured. And so when she returned years later to liberate the prison, she found him. So, how disfigured does he look? I mean, this is Tom Hardy. <laughs> you never see it, but he's right. obviously heavily scarred, and his face was mangled, which is why he wears the mask. If the mask only covers like the bottom part of his his face, but then he just takes it off and like he's he's a Darth Vader from the end of Jedi. Just the top half of his face suddenly becomes pale and scarred. Right. Like, how did that happen? No, at at no point in this movie does he remove the mask. Uh, he has like a part of the front tubing knocked off, but it's easily reassembled. So, what Way is your read on Batman's Batman voice? Because Nolan has gotten a lot of flack about it um, from The Dark Knight. Uh, I've never particularly two. had a problem with it. I mean, he does it to a degree in this movie, but its I don't think it's ever as ridiculous as it was in the first Batman movie. Uh, sorry, the Batman, Batman Begins. Begins. Yeah, I think that was when it was at its most ridiculous. I don't think it's that bad in this one. That, I've Initially, when I heard the murmurs about people really hated the Batman voice, I thought they were all just being silly, but then I realized that they're being serious about it. I was able to understand everything he said in yeah, The Dark no, Knight I, pretty well. I could understand him, I could understand Bane, I, I didn't have a problem understanding any character in this movie or any of the previous ones. Like, I think it's just something to make fun of. It's a pop culture thing at this point. Everyone thinks they can do a Batman impersonation and insists on showing you. Oh, this is a um, long movie. Two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I walked into that theater for a noon showing and got out at, like, uh, 2.55, and that was with only, like, four or five trailers. Um, 
yeah, Anne Hathaway does an amazing job as Catwoman slash Selina Kyle in this movie. She is defining this performance, and I gotta say, it's it's one of the hard ones to do because you're comparing yourself to all the other people who played versions of Catwoman. So, I mean, even right back to, like, Eartha Kitt, all of those versions of the character have been unique and brought something different. Uh, the Michelle Pfeiffer version was phenomenal, despite missing the point of the character in a couple ways. Her version of it is the modern version of Catwoman. Like, it is phenomenal. She does a great job. She's got the sexiness. She knows how to play it up to her advantage. She doesn't play the victim. She's not too hard to appear frightened when she needs to be. Like, there, there, there is a great range of emotion from this character. And she, she does the, the antagonistic flirting with Batman well when she needs to. She always stands up for herself. Like, there's a scene where she's brought into the prison, the men's prison, because they bring up the fact that, yeah, she escaped from a woman's prison when she was 16. We need higher security. And there isn't a maximum security women's prison in Gotham, apparently. So as she's walking down the, uh, the main, uh, the main aisle of the prison, being escorted by security, she's of course got, like, cat calls being whistled at her from the men in their cells. Kind of and standard she for walking down the aisle in any prison. Yeah, prison she immediately nice decides place. that, uh, one of the guys who's particularly flirting with her, she, uh, she drops the line, Aw, oh, do you want to hold hands? And she breaks the guy's wrists by doing <laughs> a, uh, a flip over them. Just like an instant graceful move that horrifically damages him, and she just continues on her way. <laughs> oh, what are they going to do? Throw oh, she, her in prison? She gives a perfect performance. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I... Uh, I do absolutely love the detail of her uh, goggles being the cat ears when she puts Other them up. Other people have said that the cat ears look kind of silly, but they set off all of my steampunk alarms because they're so goggly. No, they're they're fantastic. They're they're goggles that have a secondary component for magnification and I think uh, ultraviolet detection. And when she puts them up, they look like cat ears. That's it. It's fantastic. It's great costume design. I was sold at the word goggles. Right. Like, at, at no point does this character miss the marks of what it should be. I mean, it is Selena Kyle, the outcast entrepreneur looking out for herself and anyone she deems worth caring for. Um, I guess that brings us to uh, our Batman performance, Christian Bale. It's the same role he's played before. I mean, he is doing a very good Bruce Wayne here. At no point was I questioning it or his acting abilities. Um, I like where the character starts and ends the movie. Uh, the weirdest thing is the span of time that this movie takes place during. Uh, so between The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises, eight years have passed. And during that entire time... Bruce Wayne has just become a complete shut-in recluse. Like, they, they mention at one point, they make a Howard Hughes comparison of Bruce Wayne's probably uh, living in the east wing of his mansion with, like, ten-inch-long fingernails and peeing into mason jars. At any point, is there a scene with a long table? No, they don't do a long table scene. Damn it. Nope. Sorry. Um... <laughs> Actually, the only long table in this movie would be the Wayne Court boardroom. That's a pretty long table. Yeah, the, they do miss a couple important details of things that have happened over the years. Uh, for instance, they me they make mention early on in the film, and this becomes a major plot point later, that Bruce apparently spent half of the company's money on a clean energy initiative that he then scrapped. Like, just mysteriously ended the project said it didn't work, and just cut his losses and ran. And the company has been on the downhill ever since. Like, that's kind of an important bit of information that should have been shown. Like, the, the details of the creation of this project and the execution of it probably should have been shown to the audience, not picking up eight years later with the project locked away in a super-secret basement. 
What are those show don't tell fails? Yeah, they do a couple of those in this movie. There, there are really a couple times where it's just, yeah, we're going to tell you about this really important shit that you probably should have already known, and we don't care. Uh, part of that might be a limitation of the fact that the movie is already nearly three hours long, but I hear it has a bit of a three-act structure, with the middle act being the occupation of Gotham. Oh yeah, which without is a doubt, maybe a there little is... longer than necessary. I mean, you. Well, that's that's the section of the movie that's also the like the rebirth of Bruce Wayne, because he gets thrown into the prison where uh, Bane came from, and has to literally realign his own back with the help of the prison doctors, and climb out. <laughs> oh, so they do, do the back break. Oh yeah, they do the back break. That is a thing Bane does. It is. It so. is absolutely a thing Bane does. Yeah, it Bane without feels a doubt. Kind of so silly for the Nolan verse back. for me, but I'm also kind of no, pleased. No, I was. I was actually. I was actually like anticipating this, and if it wasn't there, I would have been disappointed. Oh no, they they break the hell out of Bruce Wayne's back without a doubt. Awesome! I need to see this immediately now. Does Bane? It happens. I will break the bat. No, Bane never shouts anything stupid like that. Um, really, the the like three act structure. I guess so. You have the the reemergence of Batman, which inevitably leads to the confrontation with Bane, in which Batman falls. Um, then you have the occupation of Gotham and the reworking of Batman, and then the final act is the battle for Gotham. It is an enormous fight on par with like the end of Harry Potter. Like, Christopher Nolan doesn't believe in... I assume in fewer magic powers happened. Fewer magic powers, but just as many explosions. And characters being badass moments. Any animated statues? Uh, no, but you do get a rather ridiculous-looking statue of Batman at the end. You know, it wouldn't be too surprising for Wayne Corp to just have, like, statues in the lobby that turn out to be robotic enforcers. That's no, the cool, the coolest bit of scenery in this movie is, without a doubt, the the new Batwing, which is phenomenal looking. At no point do you question whether this belongs in the world. It is just as cool in the initial scene where it appears as it is at the end of the movie. Uh, it's fantastic. No, th this is a really cool film and is honestly worth your time. Is it as good as The Dark Knight? No, filmmaking-wise, I can't say it is. But does it really need to be to be a good movie? I mean, when you're talking about The Dark Knight, you're talking about a perfect film. Cinematography, acting, score, special effects, all perfect. For The Dark Knight Rises to be not as good? doesn't mean it's a bad film. I would put this one on par with Batman Begins. It is a damn good movie and a wonderful conclusion to the Christopher Nolan trilogy. Like, I gotta also give props to Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who could have been the most, like, bland, boring side character ever, but he's almost as compelling as, like, the six-foot-eight guy walking around in a mask punching people. Like, his <laughs> character is just as cool as that guy. Gary Oldman still does an excellent job as Commissioner Gordon. I love um, Gary Oldman. I, I have a thing for Gary Oldman, and I'm not sure I fully understand oh, it. Oh, he, he, he's fantastic in this movie. He's always enjoyable. Um, I really I love the score named of this movie. Gordon. <laughs> I, I don't know why. The, the scoring in this movie is just as good as the scoring in um, in The Dark Knight. Bane has his own theme. He's got the, like, the rise chanting that just happens to uh, come up whenever Bane is about to appear or is doing his thing. No, it, it's a really cool movie, and it's definitely worth your time to see. It is a wonderful spectacle piece. Is it as big blow-up action-y as The Avengers? No. But would you really want that from The Dark Knight franchise? I hear the Alfred scenes are actually pretty sad. Oh no, Michael Caine gives the performance of the franchise here. Like... Making people cry. At, at, at one point in the movie, he has to fess up to everything he's done 
to Bruce Wayne, and it is a heartbreaking moment. Oh, it's a, so basically Alfred gets called on this, like, really terrible enabling he's been doing for years? Not just that. There, There's one specific moment that took place in The Dark Knight that he has to fess up to. To try to get Bruce Wayne to see what he's doing. Like, I mean... The, Biggest compliments to the writing of this movie, all of the other Batman stuff I've ever seen never takes into account just how horrible being Batman must be. Like, to someone physically and psychologically. Yeah, he's not getting sleep. His body is being beaten to hell every time he goes out. Like, just count the injuries he took during the Dark Knight. I mean, he got beaten by a lead pu- uh, with a lead pipe. He got mauled by dogs, stabbed a couple times. Like, he was in multiple car accidents. Bruce One Wayne's the- body is being torn to shreds. And no other Batman uh, media has ever acknowledged that, except the Dark Knight series. Because at the start of it, Bruce Wayne's walking around with a cane, barely able to stand up. One of the big innovations that the uh, Arkham Asylum game had was the fact that Batman got persistently more beaten up and his uh, attire got more destroyed throughout the course of the game, and it didn't revert to right. being perfect. So, yeah, that, yeah, that no, is a thing up to the point Batman where at the end of that of game, abuse. at at the end of that game, it practically looked like his mask was barely holding on anymore. And the same applies in this series. You you see Bruce Wayne being torn to shreds. No, overall, The Dark Knight Rises is totally worth seeing in every way. It is a great movie. It is a wonderful conclusion to this trilogy. It just leaves me wondering, where the hell does DC go from here? Well, if Dark Knight was The Empire Strikes Back... Does The Dark Knight Rises have Ewoks in it? It does not have Ewoks in it. There, there then it's is no... probably better than Jedi. Right. There is no specifically just stuff fluffed in for fans. Like, the only thing I could say would even be on that level, the moment where I was like, huh, was there's a scene in it where returning actor uh, Killian Murphy, uh, the Scarecrow from the franchise, shows up as basically the judge in a mob courtroom. (laughs) And his performance is meant to be humorous, and it's questionable whether the humor is designed to fit there, or whether it really does, and what should be a really horrifying scene. Uh, But but just having him in there, it's kind of just like a call-out to, yeah, he was in all three of these movies, too. No, no. Overall, there's no Ewoki bits that are designed to sell toys. Cool. However, uh, I would totally buy a toy of the Batwing. That would be pretty awesome. I yep. can't wait to see this movie. Yes, this is totally worth your time. Go see it. You will have a, an enjoyable experience. And hell, I didn't even spoil all of it. <laughs> Impressive. There's still a lot left I could spoil. So, yay. You'll get some surprises and some fun. Let's talk about Borderlands for a little bit. <laughs> Let's talk about Borderlands. Man, we kind of reviewed this once already. So, Batman doesn't use guns, but Borderlands is all about guns. So, sure as which hell do you use? the most forced segue. <laughs> so, I mean, basically what I can say about Borderlands, it feels like Diablo 3 with guns. And first Diablo person. Diablo 3, where all of the loot is guns. Uh, the whole world is guns. No, no, because there is other loot. There's shields, there's and grenade guns. mods. <laughs> like, there are other types of loot. And they're good. Like, I bought the Game of the Year edition specifically off of Steam. And I'm having an absolute blast with it. I think my problem with Borderlands initially was I was trying to... Uh, to play it on console. I don't like console first-person shooters. I don't like the controls. They're not precise enough for me. I agreed, and I've been playing it on PC also, of course, and yet it still has, like, some fairly intense aim assist, which 
The PC version of it feels a lot like a console port. There's menus where it says, press this key to continue, and you can't click on the text where it says, press this key to continue. Like if it right. were actually a native PC game, it would be able to. But it, it still plays very nice on PC and looks beautiful. Yeah, without a doubt. Like, Borderlands style, the, the quasi cell shading that it does, is gorgeous. It works. It looks really fantastic. My first impression way. of Borderlands um, was also bad, but that is kind of because it starts you off in a situation where you don't have a shield and you have kind of limited ammo for the first five to ten minutes. And so I was playing it really cautiously and staying behind cover and getting all headshots and not taking any damage because, well, one thing is that I initially knew that there was some game that existed wherein bullets were used as the currency and they were super scarce and you were saving up bullets and trying not to shoot very much. And so I was playing That's it That's Fallout, this... I think. <laughs> no, that is Metro 2033 is what it is. Ah. Which, interestingly, I also have a copy of that I got in a THQ pack from Amazon right, prior to the Steam sale. I have to play that at some point. But then... After you get through the first 10 minutes of Borderlands, it's all like, we know we didn't give you regenerating health initially, but here's a shield, and it regenerates. And then it's like, once you get your level 2 shield, it's like, oh, this it, shield It first also health regenerates your health. <laughs> and then I initially played as the lady character, but because I'd heard lots of advice that the soldier is the only correct way to play Borderlands, after I got yeah, so to... Level 5 Apparently, with the lady character. Apparently that's the way you play this game. I switched over to a soldier and got him to level 5. And he has an ability where he drops down an auto turret. And yep. when you're level 6, you get an ability such that if you stand near your auto turret, you regenerate ammo. So, I, I was playing it very cautious initially, but then it's like, regenerating shields. And regenerating health. And regenerating ammo, even. So, don't even worry about it. I think it's not a matter of the soldier is the only way to play the game right. I have a feeling that the soldier is the easiest way to solo the game. Right, Borderlands uh, is very much designed to have a party. Yeah, I, I would call this a lot like an MMO. It's not $15 a month, and it's not central servers, which means you can cheat. Which means I right. totally did after like two hours. Partially, nice. because I, I would have not cheated on this game, except for the fact that I was doing homework, and I wanted to have the option to just stop playing it and work on homework and not have to worry about dying. But <laughs> this is, other than those concessions, it is an MMO, because... Yes, the loot system is totally an MMO with random stats assigned to weapons, random drops, random pickups, um, when random you kill enemy bosses, generation. They don't stay dead. They just respawn, and you can go raid them again for more loot. Yep. There's save points around the world, but those are more like respawn points, because if you beat a boss for a mission and then die before you get back to a save point, it will respawn you at the nearest save point with the boss still dead. So it does not ever go backwards in world state. Everything always yep. goes forward like an MMO does. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I'm really having a lot of fun. I really can't wait for Borderlands 2. I, I think that game looks spectacular. But in the meantime, Borderlands 1 seems totally great. Uh, I picked up the Game of, Year, uh, game of the Year edition, so I have all four of the DLC packs to play through. I'm really looking forward to Mad Moxies. Uh, yeah, so next game, I guess. What do we want to talk about? How far did you get in Borderlands real quick? I am currently level 10 and have taken out the first two major bosses. Okay. I, there was a rather strange and disturbing scene in Borderlands. Borderlands has some story. It's not real intense, but it's there. And yep. I've gotten to a point where the second major NPC you meet has a apparently committed suicide by dangling themselves from their fan and I've not found any follow up on that so that was like super jarring and <laughs> I wonder if there's going to be more about that but that was weird I don't I don't know we will I see more in the future 
Yep. Uh, as it was it was all this really casual gameplay focused game. And then there's just this scene out of nowhere where the second NPC you meet has committed suicide. It's, whoa, this got uncomfortable real quick. Whoa. Um, so shall we go on to... Now, what what other games do we want to talk about? I have been playing old adventure games. Because adventure games are also such that you can stop playing them at any time and you don't have to worry about dying. I've played episodes 1 and 2 of Sam and Max and bought the whole Telltale bundle from the Steam Summer Sale. So I'm going to be... Ooh, si Sam and Max. Be playing Tales of Monkey Island, Back to the Future... And probably not the Jurassic Park adventure game, because that's supposed to be really bad. But Sam and Max Sounds so far, bad. I've played Season 1, Episode 1, and Episode 2, and they're kind of old and they show it, but they still are very fun. <laughs> you yeah, I've heard things. you play those games specifically for the writing. They're, they're hilarious. They're comedy games, and pretty funny. All right, then. I have been playing the complete version of Sins of the Solar Empire, Rebellion. This will be the fourth release of the same exact game. Um, the difference is, this time, with Rebellion, not only are we adding in all of the additional upgrades of Diplomacy, Entrenchment, and... I can't remember the other one. Uh, Trinity. We're also adding in the new Rebellion feature, which has split each of the factions into two distinct uh, halves, each one receiving six bonus abilities that the other side of the same faction will not have. Uh, one of those being a specific Titan, which is the largest classification of ship in the game. Uh, each faction, even within us, even the two subgroups within a faction, receives their own unique Titan. So, overall, playing Sins of the Solar Empire Rebellion, I gotta say this is probably the longest game I have ever played. Like, even if you speed up the game, which there are multiple methods of doing this within the game itself. It is uh, in cannot... general real-time, right? Or is it turn-based? Yes, in, ge in general it is a real-time, which is why I preferred this one over Galactic Conquest. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other game that I saw. I, it just came out. Man, why can't I remember this? Uh, Endless Space. Because this is actually real-time, rather than turn-based, I had more interest in it. Um, it is a very slow game to play, without a doubt, but makes up for it in the fact of it allows you lots of customizable options of how you are going to win your game. Because we're adding in all of the packs from the previous uh, expansions to this, you can win the game through diplomacy. In other words, just getting the other empires to agree with you enough that they won't uh, attack you. If you get a high enough rating with everyone, you win the game. Uh, you can win through trade. Basically, I have more monies than you and have more income rolling in. Uh, you can win through a military victory. You can win through a homeworld victory wherein you just sack the enemy's homeworld and you win. There are lots of different methods to claim victory in this. Hell, you can win through researching more technology than your opponents. Is there a technology victory? And if so, yes. what is the hyper-technology you have to invent? Because in Civilization, um, I... it's just spacecraft. I'm not sure how you win in Sins based on technology. I think you just have to completely research one of the technology trees. Ah. Which is a lot harder than it sounds, because there are uh, rather heavy requirements for researching everything. I like the idea of the fancy technologies that you get, that you win the game with, and there's... Oh man, I don't remember the name of the game. It's not Uplink, but there's a game where you play an AI and you're hacking lots of computers, and you're inventing... Pyro, you there? There you are. And you're inventing new technologies... And the way you win the game by technology in that game is inventing apiothesis, which means becoming a god. It's like, yeah, I invent the technology where I'm a god. That's just a pretty standard technology. What do you have? I'm a god. No, I, I totally... 
understand giving the multiple routes other than a military victory in this game. And I think it's fantastic that they have that available. Uh, despite that, I still kind of get the impression that this plays like if you wanted to play a StarCraft match that was 10 hours long and had a big tech tree. Yeah, I mean, essentially. Like, part of the issue is that the ships move so slowly once they enter the gravity of a planet or star that even when you have large-scale combat going on, it's going to take a while. The ships are made to last. You're not going to have one ship easily blow up another in a couple seconds. Like, even two of the lowest-level craft firing at each other, they're going to be shooting for at least a good five, uh, sorry, three to four minutes, possibly more, before either of them is destroyed. Well, what's the combat look like? Is it visually interesting, or is it just dice rolls occurring behind the screen? Uh, it, it is mostly die, die rolls behind the screen. Um, basically, two ships will come in contact with each other, and they have a flat value damage output that they do. And it will be modified by a ship's armor, uh, various effects by the planetary body that they're around. So, for instance, if a planet has higher gravity and a craft is firing towards planet, it will actually be hitting harder. That was one of the and things that always kind of turned me off of Civilization, is that the, the it has combat animations, but they're really rudimentary. It's just a unit goes up, it smacks the other one, the other smacks back, and then eventually right. one of them dies. I mean, in this one, you see the ships firing on each other with their various weapons, and some of the weapons look really cool. Like, when a ship fires a, uh, a plasma barrage, you see this giant cloud of superheated energy fire from one ship and collide and explode when it hits another. Ah, and so are you designing ship designs, choosing, like, which types of guns a particular ship should have? No, uh, you are specifically picking the type of ship that you are using, and that ship is equipped with certain weapons. Now, you can choose to research certain uh, trees of weapon upgrades. So, for instance, if I'm playing as the uh, Advent, my usual race, they have a specific light craft that uses uh, beam technology and as its only weapon. So, as one of the hardest hitting single fire, uh, single target weapons in the game, I always max these things first because they dominate the early game. Like, you get a little swarm of the buggers, pick a target, and it's gonna go down. Huh. Sounds pretty cool. I already have, like, several games that seem pretty similar, and they're hard to get into because the matches last for a long time, and you have to know nearly the entire tech tree in order to make good decisions starting at the beginning. But the right. idea of them seems good. I might buy this yeah. one after I get through Star Ruler or AI War Fleet Command. Yeah, w without a doubt, this is a cool game. I, I enjoy the hell out of Sins of Solar Empire. Cool. Yep. So, Pixie, what you been up to? Um, well... Like I was telling you earlier, I picked up Left 4 Dead 2 during the Steam Summer Sale, along with a whole bunch of other stuff. So um, how many so, people have accused you of ruining the game? Uh, I only played with Pyrosim Pyrus and uh, Brad, so... So... at least one. <laughs> God damn it, Pixie, stop ruining the game! We're not even you're playing! Making every you're making everything bad! Like, I blame you for getting attacked by a smoker, even though that's, like, something you have no control over. The... Right, especially when it's bots playing the smoker. The dynamics like, of the special zombies spawn there. are kind of interesting, because they force you to stay together as a group, because as soon as you get attacked by a special zombie, you're basically completely helpless unless somebody's helping you. Right, but on the same lines, if you're, if the special zombie, if just one special zombie attacks you, they are incredibly easy to get off of you. Right, so long as you have someone else. Uh, you can't deal with them alone, even if they're, it's just one special zombie. Right. Unless, I suppose, you get into the knocked down state, then you get to use your pistol. Even if you're, the mechanics of the slots are kind of weird, because you can carry, like, a melee weapon in your 
um, ammo list slot, and then you have no choice to use your pistol unless you are in the knocked down state, in which case you have your pistol, which is weird. But I guess it's fine. The other thing I was going to say about the special zombies is they all kind of seem the same. And smokers are the most dominant ones, but the hunters and jockeys are strategically basically identical to smokers. It doesn't make a difference. No, the jockey's different because, um, as I saw it playing in PvP with uh, Left 4 Dead 2, the role of the jockey is to remove the most valuable person on the team. Your job is to jump on the person who is best at uh, killing special zombies or who is leading the group and just drag them away. Get them out of there. You're a really good jockey if you can get the enemy player all the way back to the starting point by themselves and bring them down. Because then not only do the others have to go retrieve them, they're now back at the start. That makes sense. So, how does the zombies versus humans competitive multiplayer work? Do humans respawn, or do you have to rescue them from buildings? Um, essentially, what you what you do is you score points for getting your uh, getting the human players to the end of the level. Uh, they score, I think, it's twenty five points for each player that makes it all the way to the end, and for every player that doesn't make it to the end, you earn a percentage based for how far they got. Actually, correction, you can earn up to 25 for how far you get, and then you earn a bonus 25 for actually surviving. Okay. So up and to 50 points per points? player. Zombies only earn points when they are the human players. Oh, okay. So basically so what will happen is you'll dive into a level, and one team will be assigned to be the humans, and one team will be the zombies. The human players have their chance to earn points by so making it's it to the baseball then. <laughs> yep. Then the zombie players will switch and it basically tests who can make the most points. How many innings? As many as you want. Depend whatever the scenario is. That sounds so interesting. So for instance, if you're playing the uh the gas run, that's a Let's see, there's To the Gas Works, there's Back to the Gas Works. Uh, that's a four-parter. Because you've got the run f through the town to the sugar mill, you've got from the sugar mill to the gas station, the gas station, or the sugar mill back, and then the town back. <laughs> Which is, that one is actually my absolute favorite of the Left 4 Dead 2 scenarios. I think that one is ridiculously cool because you're given an objective of where you're going and then you get to repeat it in the pouring rain. Yeah, I enjoyed the time I spent playing Left 4 Dead with Pixie quite a bit. I'm not sure I would ever want to play it with randos, but it seems very fun with uh, human friends. Yeah, I think I agree with you on that. I played a bunch of PvP with randoms and just was never having fun, so I had stopped. At the very least, I guess you need voice chat in order to coordinate the teamwork, since teamwork is like the central message. But... Right, they have they have t uh, uh, voice communication in the game, but yeah, they're, honestly, that's what I was gonna say. it's never really worth it. It's better than nothing, I guess. If you we were really dedicated to playing this game and didn't have any friends, that would be much better than nothing. Right. That's right. Yep. You don't have any so, friends, audience. I'm telling you that now. You jerks. Uh, one thing that also got picked up on the Steam Summer Sale was L.A. Noir, which I already owned on the Xbox 360 in its 4 DVD long form. But Pyro, you've just gotten a chance to play it. Yes. Uh, Pixie had told me a long, long time ago, back when she was playing it on Xbox, that the Back when I did the review? Yes. That the notebook interface for uh, just basically keeping track of evidence and doing interviews was 
amazing. And I, I had taken her word for it, but I didn't know how intensely amazing it was until I experienced it myself. That is the best user interface ever. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw that out there. It's that user interface is the best one that's ever been developed. <laughs> it is super classy looking because it's like you're looking at your character and he pulls out his notebook and the camera just smoothly transitions to looking at the notebook and it's like oh man that was beautiful and not only that but like it's so intuitive everything moves really slow smoothly everything is positioned in the exact place that you would expect it to be it is well fictionalized because they put the interface in the world and don't need a hud but they attach it to something that would realistically be showing up in the world. Uh, I played just a tiny little bit of Dead Space recently, and Dead Space is famous for not having any out-of-world user interface, but it's kind of poorly fictionalized because there will be holograms in the world in Dead Space telling you to press the X button, and it's like, well, you kind of stop short of fictionalizing this because there's this hologram here, but it's telling me to press the X button. And L.A. Noir kind of has a tiny bit of that. Uh, as soon as you meet somebody, you'll have, like, a, a really good police sketch of them. But, you know, I figure maybe Cole Phelps is just a really fast artist. You, you blink and he just sketches it out. Also, well, it's like better a than him drawing, like, stick figures, you know? Uh-huh. Cole Phelps draws a really awkward stick figure. <laughs> that could also be funny. I'm a police forensic artist and I can't draw... There's also a button that says review evidence, but it looks like something that would... All of the styling of it is like it would be in a notebook. It's really cool. Right. So yeah, I mean, Steam Summer Sale. My wallet is purged. Uh, one of the nice things I like about adventure games is that, or at least the uh, Telltale adventure games, is that they come in episodes. So by buying the Sam and Max games, uh, it was like uh, 16 episodes for like $10, and each episode is only like two hours, so it's not like they're 40 hours each, but it made 16 entries in my Steam game list, and at some point during the summer sale, I got to the point where I'm just like, I want my list to be longer. There just needs to be more things in this list. And that served that nicely. a pretty long so I'm list. Currently th I'm currently thinking we should totally review uh, Dungeon Fighter Online. Dungeon Basically, Fighter... it is like... It is an 80s side-scrolling style arcade beat-em-up that is also an MMO where you level your character. It is a free-to-play. Uh, it has just been added to Steam. That sounds like something we could do. Oh, I watched a quick look at this on Giant Bomb. They did not like it very much. Um, yeah, we can play a little bit of this at some point. Sounds good. All right, then. So I think that'll cover us. We're going to keep playing more stuff. Woo. Uh, next week, what are we doing? Stuff. I, I mean, for the show, dumbass. Stuff. Actually, we're probably going to be talking about Zyra, provided she actually comes out this week. Which... Uh, and you thought we would go a whole show without a League of Legends reference? <laughs> nope. As if. Was she supposed to come out and then didn't? Uh, no, but what they did is release a major patch updating Twitch, uh, Evelyn, and a bunch of other characters that needed redesigns. So guess who has to patch after the show? So, it is interesting to see Twitch and Evelyn now back in the standard play rotation. But at the same time, it also means that people are playing Twitch and Evelyn, and ugh. And you are not a fan of Stel people playing Evelyn. I'm not a are fan of stealth as a mechanic. <laughs> are more people playing them? I thought they kind of got nerfed. Uh, again, they just got reworked, so they are unnerfed. Ah. Evelyn is back to playable. In fact, she can do 25% of everyone in a team fight's health if uh, she drops her ult properly. Well, and then she cool. just proceeds to run around beating people up. We will talk about that and whatever else we manage to play next yep. week. Next week, more stuff. 
hey, I'll be done with classes next week. And yeah, we'll that's be getting right. ready for, <laughs> I we'll be like getting ready for Gen Con. Gen Con, it's baby. A baby. Oh, I've already got a shopping list that's already over three hundred dollars. Way to go, son. Yup. So yes, tune in next time as we talk about ways we're going to purge our wallets at Gen Con. Sure thing. In the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Parasim. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk.